Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland's uh, conference special here at the SNP's 2019 conference at the brand new event complex in Aberdeen. Unfortunately, we had a couple of problems getting a decent broadband connection here at the venue, uh, so we've not been able to stream out very much, but we did manage to get some excellent interviews. So today you're going to hear some interviews that we heard uh, on Sunday, Firstly, with Stuart Hosey MP, and then we're also hearing from Drew Hendry MP and Lorena Lopez de la Calle, who is the president of the European Free Alliance, which is the party the SNP is a member of in the European Parliament. We hope you enjoy these and we'll have some more in following shows. So we're here with Stuart Hosey, the SNP's Westminster spokesman on international trade. Stuart, how are you? Very well, very how, well indeed. How's your, your conference going so far? The conference is great, it's very well attended, there's a lovely mood to it. Could be a very big event as usual these days, and we're raring to go. Well, I suppose uh, one benefit of it right now is that you're very far away from Westminster. Um, <laughs> That's true, but sadly, we'll be down tomorrow morning. You are back tomorrow it's morning. It's Queen's speech. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you look at the what's going on in Westminster just now, I mean, clearly everything has been dominated by Brexit for seemingly forever. Mm. Um, how do you feel it's going? We heard this morning uh, about Boris Johnson apparently offering big compromises to the EU and potentially bringing a deal back. What's your what's your uh, working assumption about what that might look like? I don't think he's going to offer any significant compromise at all. In 2016, the SNP put forward a compromise. We'd have to stay in the single market and the customs union, and they would still have to be free movement of people, which Scotland needs and which Scots benefit from. Uh, Theresa May said no, Boris Johnson said no. I still think he's determined to boost through either a no deal or the hardest possible Brexit with some kind of deal. My judgment is there's no real compromise. Mm -hmm. And we've heard from uh, the, the EU, there was some opinion polling done uh, recently that said that uh, a majority of people in Europe think that Britain should just now be cut loose, mm -hmm. that we, there shouldn't be any more negotiation. Do you, do you get the sense that the EU is, is willing to talk more? No, I think the EU is willing to talk more, and I think they're also willing to offer a significant extension if it was to facilitate an election or a second referendum or even some genuine discussions that involve real compromise. But I don't think they're prepared to stand and hang fire for too much longer if it's just discussions in name only, which appears to be the name of the game for Boris Johnson, simply run down the clock. Now, uh, we, we also have the, the possibility of a, a general election. Mm. Um, presumably this would be after we've seen Boris Johnson stick the, the letter to Brussels yeah. in the post box. Um, what do you think the, the likely outcome of that would be? Do you, do you think that's actually going to clarify anything, at least in, in English politics? Well, in English politics it's very hard to tell. Uh, and of course there's a danger, isn't there, always, that you end up with uh, another hung parliament. But therein lies an opportunity for England and for the UK political establishment. The House of Commons needs to start behaving as if it's a PR parliament, where negotiations take place way in advance of votes inside the parliament, the way the Scottish Government had to do in 2007. And, they can't, and indeed today. But the UK Government can't continue to pretend they're running some kind of majority in a two-party system, when as it stands today, they've got a majority of minus 43, mm -hmm. they've lost a record seven out of seven votes, yet they're behaving as if they can just bully things through without any discussion. They're going to have to change and perhaps, perhaps, if there's another hung parliament, that's the opportunity to do that. And what role would the SNP play? In, in such a scenario? I mean, could you, for example, could you envision a scenario where the SNP would trade support or support for a, a Tory government in order to facilitate a, an independence referendum? I've never seen any scenario where I would support a Tory government full stop. Now, there are opportunities, of course, if Labour were the largest single party to try and do a deal to make sure progressive politics were brought to the floor, 
and of course it also makes sense for Scotland to get the Section 30 transfer to have the independence referendum for which we already have a mandate but no I don't see uh, any scenario whatsoever where the SNP would back a Tory government. Okay. And just to your own, uh, your own remit for a bit, um, <coughs> international trade is something where uh, we were promised that there would be multiple, uh, I think 40 trade deals mm. were going to be ready to go on Brexit Day. Um, how many do you, are you aware <laughs> of right now? Well, there are some signed, there are some uh, memorandums of understanding signed. But let's be really clear, even the rollover deals with Switzerland and Norway modest, friendly, and close European trading nations. Even those rollover deals didn't roll over what we had before. The UK's record so far has been absolutely lamentable. And when I was in the States a year or so ago, I was told the same thing over and over again. When the UK came to negotiate a trade deal with the US, the UK would be required to put everything on the table and the US would be required to put nothing on the table. That's why we say in the SNP, a no deal Brexit or a bad deal Brexit will see the British government of whatever colour lead the economy into danger. And I think we need to be very cautious indeed about handing untrammeled power to Boris Johnson to cut trade deals. Now the, the international trade brief didn't really exist before, uh, before the Brexit vote, it came into existence precisely because uh, we wouldn't have the EU negotiating on our behalf. Um, do you feel that the, the UK, uh, that, that, that even that, just that department, is, is in a position to be a, an effective negotiator uh, if, if, Brexit, if Brexit does happen? Uh, is, is the British government in a position to actually negotiate good deals? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, the UK hasn't negotiated a trade deal on its own for over 40 years. We've benefited from, benefited from the EU's trade negotiations. That's 70 trade deals around the world that the EU has struck that the UK and Scotland benefits from. The current UK International Trade Department isn't fit for purpose. And I worry greatly, greatly, that when or if they're left to their own devices they'll simply roll over to the United States and they won't be able to strengthen our hand in any major market anywhere in the world. Let me put it another way, I think the deals we'll end up with are far, will be far far worse than the deals the EU have already struck. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking a wee bit further forward, um, what do you think uh, Scotland can achieve in the, the, inter, the, the international trade arena. Clearly, the goal would be to be part of the EU. Um, but what what do you think Scotland has to, to offer the world in terms of trade uh, where, where we could develop better as an independent country? Well, I think there are a number of things which we have which will enhance our standing in the world when we're independent. And not least when it comes to food and drink and tourism, we have a clean environment clean food, unadulterated, fresh water. I know they sound like very basic things, but they're incredibly important. If we sell ourselves on the basis of our environment and our food and drink exports and tourism in Scotland being environmentally sound, that's a heck of a strong thing to be able to do. If, on the other hand, we're forced to accept the imports of genetically modified that or chlorine wash this, if we're forced to reduce agriculture and agro -sanity, sanitation regulation, I think we're in a, a really bad place. Yeah, this has been one of the great kind of warnings that people have been making about any potential mm. trade deal with the US is that we would be forced to reduce our, our, uh, our food standards. Um, what other risks do you think there are um, to to our, to our own way of life uh, from, from Brexit? Well, in, 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 in those terms, in terms of what, what, what trade might, might force upon us? Well, it's hard to know precisely, but if 84% tariffs on beef, 46% tariffs on lamb, 20% tariffs on mackerel, difficulties 
getting fish consignments over the channel without them rotting because of the queues, massive shortages of labour, particularly in agriculture. One can easily see the rural way of life in Scotland under quite enormous pressure because of Brexit. And um, as we, we look forward, as you said a wee bit earlier, we, we already have a mandate for independence. Yeah. Um, we have heard the First Minister say <coughs> uh, this morning on Andrew Marr that he, she intended to request the Section 30 order soon. Um, what's your feeling about how that, how that plays out? Do you expect Boris Johnson to casually sign that letter or are we going to need to really twist his arm to sign that as well? The Scottish Government has three mandates for independence. A Holyrood mandate, a Westminster mandate and a vote in the Scottish Parliament. If there is and we win in Scotland the next Westminster election, it simply strengthens our hand. And I'm glad the First Minister is going to request formally the Section 30 transfer uh, to ensure that whatever we do is the gold standard. There comes a time when even the most intransigent and unionist UK Prime Minister has to decide are they a Democrat or are they a despot? David Cameron, to his credit, was a Democrat. Uh, let's hope Boris Johnson's response is the same. Now, a lot of us, of course, at the time thought that David Cameron, and, and David Cameron, I think, has even said something similar himself, that he, he agreed to it readily because he was convinced he could win, or convinced he would win, rather. Um, Boris Johnson, one would assume, is rather less confident at this stage. We've seen polling today that says we're bang on 50-50. Um, do, you, do you think there is a... a, a do you think he's, he's very likely to, to agree to a Section 30 order? Or do you think that there's going to need to be some other, some other trigger that we can pull? I don't know whether he's likely or very likely or not likely to do anything. In that sense, it's a bit Trump-esque. No one knows what's going to be in the next tweet or the next random thought from, thought from Dominic Cummings. Who knows? All I know is that we're doing the right thing. We're doing it properly. We want to do it democratically. And in terms of pulling a rabbit from a hat on our side to strengthen our position, the only thing we can do is keep on winning, keep on refreshing that mandate. And I have a little faith that the Scottish Government are looking at alternative scenarios uh, just in case the UK Government decide democracy is not for them. Mr. Well, Stuart Jose, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. So we are joined now by Lorena Lopez de la Calle. I hope I've pronounced that right. Perfectly. And you are the president of the European Free Alliance. Now, a lot of our viewers probably don't really know much about how uh, Europe-wide political parties work. So could you tell us just a little bit about what the EFA is? So the European Political Alliance is, uh, um, to start with, the only European political party that stands up and allowed for self-determination. Uh, we are a party which uh, re reunites uh, 46 uh, political parties. We are present in 19 um, European states and uh, now we have uh, 13 MEPs. So we are all working together, um, uh, in fact, to defend democracy because we are uh, fighting for the respect of the right to decide of the peoples and that is uh, pure democracy so uh, we work on different subjects together and uh, uh, well, that, that is what uh, the IFA stands for. Okay, now uh, of course the EFA includes uh, the SNP, yes. um, it also includes Plaid Cymru which uh, many of our viewers will know about as well as the, the Catalan movement and uh, you're from Basque, the Basque also. Uh, yourself. Um, so what other movements are, are involved? Um, that a lot of our viewers won't, won't know how many kind of independence movements there are around oh, Europe. There, there, there are and there are a lot. Um, uh, not all, I have to say, for independence, but all for certain uh, for devolution and accountability. Because we think that uh, really local governance is the key and doing things bottom up is the key. 
So we are all for devolution. Um, among the independentists, of course, we have uh, the, the, the Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians in the, in the Basque Peninsula, but we also have uh, people from Valencia, uh, from the Balears, uh, from the Canary Islands. Uh, in France, we have the Britons, the Corsicans, which are very active and we are very proud of them because even if they are small islands and 320,000 inhabitants, uh, for us it is not a matter of numbers but a matter of democracy. And for the first time ever, the Corsicans, uh, the nationalists, are in, in government. And also we have the Alsatians, uh, the Basques, uh, you know that the Basque country is separated by the Pyrenees and we are present in both uh, states, Spain and France. But then we also have in Italy, uh, for example, Val d'Aosta, uh, which is an uh, autonomous community with a, a status recognized, uh, the Lombardy, um, uh, we have Friuli, uh, well, and then we have the Macedonians, people in Silesia, the Kashubians. Um, so uh, uh, we have also minorities and displaced people, uh, uh, Hungarians, dis Hungarians displaced in uh, Romania or in Slovakia. Or so we uh, we represent uh, the will of all those peoples. Uh, to be respected in a united Europe, because all of us are pro-Europeans. We, we really feel that Europe is our home. Uh, we, do not, we do not feel at all, uh, some of us, uh, uh, like uh, the Catalans or the Basques, of course, or the Corsicans, we don't feel as nationals of the states where uh, yeah. we are presently. Uh, but we all feel European, so that is uh, what unites us, uh, the fact of being European and fighting for another Europe. Because for the moment, Europe is the Europe of the states, and we think that uh, uh, Europe, in fact, was created uh, uh, to foster uh, respect and uh, coexistence after the wars. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, uh, to, to have stability and peace in Europe, you need to respect the will of every single people. And uh, so we, we, we defend uh, all those uh, different degrees of devolution. Of course, uh, independence being our top ranking uh, wish for everybody. Now, I mean, it's, it's not the, the biggest group in the, in the parliament. How big is the, the group currently? Well, uh, the, we, um, for a long time now, uh, IFA has been working with the Greens. Mm -hmm. And um, in this uh, moment, uh, the group IFA Greens is uh, for the first time the fourth group in the European Parliament. We used to, to be uh, behind number mm -hmm. five or six. Uh, but with the Greens, we are uh, in uh, the fourth position, and uh, in, for this term, it is very important to take it into account because um, you know that the majorities in the European Parliament uh, can be compared um, to the majorities in the in the in the Westminster yeah. Parliament, uh, where uh, uh, lab, uh, Conservatives, Labour, and uh, and uh, Lib Dems. Can, can, can make majorities in the European Parliament also. But being the fourth, uh, we can tilt some positions sometimes to one side or the other. And the second thing that unites us, uh, I was describing IFA, is uh, uh, civic nationalism. We are, we are for, uh, for uh, uh, social justice and well-being for all the people that live in our territories. So we can tilt uh, the balance in, in, in different debates, not only uh, in the self-determination debate that still has to make its way, unfortunately, in Europe. We are seeing that they are not very proactive, let's say. But uh, we will not despair, because if you take things with perspective, um, 10 years ago we were only a few, uh, and, and 20 years ago we were uh, the funny people uh, sitting the back benches, you know, but uh, we are progressing and we are uh, rapidly progressing and uh, we are progressing why because we are asking for things that should be normal and some people want to let us think that are not normal mm -hmm. do you think part of that growth is is uh, a cause of or do you think it's uh, it's it's part of the the same general movement where scotland and catalonia have both had major pushes for independence recently do you think that's 
uh, emboldened some of these other uh, movements around Europe? Uh, the, the group, uh, you mean the Fagrin group no, or which the, group? The, 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 the successes that that have or, ah, yes, yes, that of, of course, Scotland of in Scotland and yes. Catalonia, the, the the profile of those movements. It, it is a combined uh, situation. Uh, first of all, um, and I could even uh, say in that uh, in in that sense, uh, the way that the crisis has been managed has been an effect also, because mm. in our smaller countries, uh, the crisis uh, we have proved that we have managed it in a better way. And still we could have done much better if we were fully independent. But nonetheless, even with devolved uh, powers, we have managed better. That is on the one hand. Then on the other hand, the reactions of our centralistic uh, states help. In the case of Spain and France, it is clear, because the more we were uh, proving that we were doing things uh, uh, well and getting majorities, the bigger was the reaction against us. And you know, whenever someone um, uh, doesn't want to listen to you and you have good arguments uh, uh, to propose, uh, then, then, then you get... Um, no, you, you react in your vote, and we are going up in votes in, in all of our parties. Uh, when you ask for democracy, in total absence of violence, uh, asking uh, for uh, you know uh, a better Europe for everybody, this is a winning message, and and it, it works and it's going up because also, as I say, um, uh, uh, Westminster and London are, are helping a lot. The, the Scottish cause. Uh, they promised you a lot of things in 2014, and they they were just uh, it was the end of the world. It was a doom message, uh, which proved to be uh, false. And uh, on the contrary, they told you stay with us and, and we will all stay in the EU and then it is the contrary. And of course people, you know, sometimes people uh, are bright huh? and they have their own minds and some, some governments think that people can be manipulated. But I believe in the will of the people and the strength of our citizens. We are all together. Civic society is also very important, I have to say. In all of our countries, civic, civic society is very active. And when, uh, apart from the political parties, sometimes the political parties we cannot uh, um, reach everybody. But it is very good that civil society mobilizes on different subjects because together, yes, we can change things. When you have that conditions, civil society and governments that, that know how to listen to their people and determination to go forward, even if we have difficulties, then we go forward. And I, we are going uh, forward. and. Uh, uh, Scotland too, of course, of course. Now, uh, as you said, this is a, a, an exclusively civic nationalist uh, par uh, party. There's, um, I know there are other movements within Europe which are more kind of ethnically based, which mm -hmm. are, are excluded from the, the FA. I know mm -hmm. that's that's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 um, the situation in in Catalonia, though. Um, that obviously there was significant state violence um, back in their uh, referendum a couple of years ago, um, and we're we're expecting to hear sentencing for tomorrow. some of those tomorrow some of those Tuesday. politicians Tuesday. tomorrow. Mm. The the EU has been notably quiet about that, um, and yet, as you say, these are parties and organisations that are enthusiastically pro-EU. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had similar kind of unpleasantness uh, from the EU during our referendum. There was a, a, a kind of, no, we, we don't want you, we're not going to let you back in kind of thing mm -hmm. coming across. Do you think, um, do you think the EU uh, should be more supportive of these, these smaller movements? Do you think as a as, a, as an institution it should be saying well what you do is up to you and you'll be welcome when you make the decision or do you think that they it's right that they, they kind of stick with the member states that mm -hmm. um, you know three weeks ago we had um, uh, Maggi uh, now it, her family name skips me an SNP uh, member um, 
What a pity, I forgot. But she was with us in Brussels um, in the Copeters Foundation. And she rightly said that, um, we are completely agree on that, that there are three important R's, which is recognition, uh, representation, and reform. Uh, so the EU, uh, as I was saying before, the EU of the states has um, an ending date. Uh, sometimes when they ask us uh, when do you think that this will happen or not happen, uh, the European Union, especially without the UK, uh, is uh, on the downward uh, uh, direction. Uh, so the EU has to realize that they have to open the way to all the peoples that live in the European Union and do not have a representation. In why, one way or another, they know that it is not fair that in the Council of Ministers fisheries, in the case of Scotland or the Basque Country, which are very important, are discussed by people from Madrid or from London. That has no sense, even today, without discussing about independence. So they know that they have to tackle this thing about representation. Recognition, it, they have to recognize all our peoples, because it is a matter of respect. They are not alone. And then reform, why? Because um, European Free Alliance has been asking and pushing for the reform of the treaties. One day will come where the reform of the treaties will have to be tackled because we, the, the EU is, too, is prisoner of its own rules and we want a Europe of, um, of progress and a, a Europe of, uh, of respecting and learning ones with, uh, with the others. Huh? And uh, so we, we think that the Euro has, the Europe has to change. And indeed, uh, we are not um, pessimistic on that because there are already some countries that uh, are for uh, respecting the right to design, starting with Belgium, uh, one of the uh, parties that was and will probably be in government is member of the e EFA, which is NBA, and uh, they are for self-determination. And uh, Ireland, of course, huh? and uh, Portugal, maybe the smaller countries. What, what about Malta, Luxembourg? So we have to work uh, in the European Parliament uh, through those uh, nationalities, and there are also uh, in the parliaments, uh, European par the national parliaments, members of the European Union. Uh, there has been a lot of votes for the respect of self-determination. Also, so there are other uh, uh, stages where our message is coming through. So it is a question of matter. Of course, if there is violence, those things can, can be, they, they, should, uh, they should intervene. Uh, we are uh, expecting two very hard weeks uh, starting next t Monday or Tuesday uh, in, in uh, Catalonia. If the reaction of the Spanish state is as harsh as it was before, if violence is used, um, if, if the EU has been so proactive in the case, and we are happy for that, in the case of the attacks on the Kurdish population, uh, why shouldn't be doing the same thing with their nationals, the European nationals? Uh, and in the case, that is if they use violence, in the case of, of uh, Scotland, when you are only asking for the fulfillment of uh, the international law, of all the treaties signed by, by the, 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 the British state, the UN, all the treaties that prone and ask for self respect of self determination when you put things to the vote and you abide by the vote because it seems sometimes that we will we will not uh, uh, if we do we disagree with the vote well, then we don't no 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 put it to the vote and if we win we win but put it to the vote that is what we are asking well Lorena Lopez de, de la Calle, thank you so much. It's been a to very you. interesting talk. A so pleasure. Thank you for coming. And go ahead with determination we'll be here with you. Thank you. Okay. We're joined now by Drew Hendry, MP, the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy spokesperson for the SNP at Westminster. And Drew, how's your conference so far? Well, I think it's great. I think we've all got a real buzz from the speech that Ian Blackford made earlier and some of the uh, early motions that we've seen on the floor. It's a great thing to be here and connect with everybody across the SNP family and uh, to be really geared up for what is an exciting future. And. Uh, 
Now we've we've spoken to a couple of uh, MPs already who are all about to hear back down to, to Westminster. You though have a, a motion to propose tomorrow. That's right. Our branch in Venice City has put forward a motion on uh, future maritime trade uh, for Scotland. Something that's vitally important if Scotland's going to take its place as a independent member of the European Community to make sure that we've got direct trading links not just with uh, Europe but indeed with the rest of the world and not so reliant on the carbon eating road transport network that we have for most of our goods and services going down to the south of England uh, and coming from there at the moment. Now obviously as a as an island nation um, maritime issues are quite important what do you think uh, is the the most important thing for, for Scotland about having those connections? Well, the, Scotland's always had ancient connections with the rest of the world. It's a very outgoing country and for, uh, for the past thousand years we've been trading uh, internationally. What we've lost over the, the, uh, the past few hundred years are those direct links to make it easier for us to go out and you know, state our place uh, in the world and maintain that. And of course, over the decades, we've lost more and more. It's very important that we use our unique situation, situated as we are with the easy access to the north of Europe and of course, the shortest distance uh, across the Atlantic between Europe and the American mainland, um, to, to really take charge of that advantage and make sure that we've got a network of trade that's fit for the future. Now, um Obviously that's uh, something that's going to be very important for an independent Scotland and could be very important even if we weren't to achieve independence. Um, but generally Which we will. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but um, generally speaking, um, industrial strategy are not words that we hear very often in no. relation to Westminster government. What what is what are you actually trying to achieve in terms of uh, industrial strategy at Westminster now? Well, Westminster has been absolutely crippled by the uh, uh, Brexit process. It's, uh, it's completely ignored uh, industry and business. And of course, the irony is that the UK government will say they've got an industrial strategy and they'll pin lots of you know, good sounding things onto that, like electric vehicles, automation and so forth and so forth, technologies of the future. Mm -hmm. But of course, unless it's in the underpinned with something that matters to business and the economy, it doesn't work. So for example, Every single industrial group that's given evidence to my committee, the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee, has said that Brexit's going to be bad for them. The existing situation that they've got is the one that works best for them across every field from uh, uh, automotive to, uh, uh, to, to, to the um, uh, nuclear section, to not that I believe in nuclear, but uh, to retail, to all of the different sections we've interviewed. They've all said their current situation is best for them. Any form of Brexit is going to harm them. So it's, it's an oxymoron for the UK government to say they've got this industrial strategy because the strategy at the moment is to run it into the ground. Yeah. Um, so in your, your other uh, issues, as you say, this, this, the supposedly pro-business Tories are doing something that is going to be very bad for a lot of business. But um, energy is one of, your other, uh, one of the other parts yeah. of your, uh, your remit. And obviously, um, with climate change uh, being really getting higher and higher yeah. on, on everyone's agenda now, energy is a, is a big issue. What do you think um, that should be happening at Westminster in relation to the climate just now? Well, first thing they should do is give us the powers to unlock the rest of our potential. We've done some fabulous work here in Scotland with renewable energy, but that's been done under environmental legislation. What the UK government have done is held back uh, onshore wind, they've held back solar of all things, probably the most benign of all uh, renewable energies, and yet they've been punishing that for the past uh, well. We need to have a massive rush to renewable electrification, and instead what the UK government have been doing is investing money in the enormous white elephant that is Hinkley Sea nuclear power plant and their nuclear obsession. Now, Hinkley is the most expensive object on planet Earth. Um, at the moment, and it's a completely failed and wasted uh, technology. We shouldn't be investing in that. They should turn that around and allow us to get on with doing things that are really going to make a difference to the planet and not leave uh, that horrendous legacy into the future. But there's so much that can be done. In Scotland, we've planted 22 million trees. 84% of all of the trees that have been planted in the UK, and we need to do uh, more, but they also need to do their bit as well. Westminster has talked tough and talked big on their 2050 target, 
In Scotland, of course, it's 2045 for net zero. Um, but actually what they're doing is not delivering on the nitty gritty for it. So with Scotland having all the powers that we need to do this, we can actually show the undeniable uh, way forward for other countries to take advantage of the revolution that's in front of us to make sure that we're really tackling climate change. And to, to tie two of those things together, what uh, what role will um, will that that green energy sector play in uh, an independent Scottish industrial strategy? Well, we're going from a place where we've had oil and gas as part of the economic mix. We've never seen the advantage of that, but into a place now where we've got clean green renewable energy in abundance. We've got over 25% of Europe's offshore wind and tidal potential. Onshore we've got uh, still got lots more opportunity and we've got much more to do and take advantage of. What we can do is make sure that the mistakes that were made by Westminster in the past of not having a sovereign oil fund that are actually taken care of in the future, that we have a renewable fund set up, that we're making sure we're taking advantage of our uh, resources. But key to this will be uh, maximising our potential from uh, carbon capture, utilisation and storage. Scotland has an abundant potential with existing infrastructure to take carbon back out of the, the atmosphere, back out of uh, you, the uh, fossil fuels that we're using just now and put it back under the ground using the same technology that we extracted it from. And the, to give you an example, St Fergus, which is not far from this exhibition centre here today, St Fergus has a potential of, uh, starting potential of 5.7 gigatons of storage. Now to put that into context, that's the equivalent of all Scotland's emissions from 2016, 150 times over. Now that's a, not only a potential for us to do our bit here locally, but it's our potential for us to do a bit for others as well in terms of taking some of that carbon and putting it back underground. Mm -hmm. And I mean, planting all those trees is, is helping with that too. Isn't there's it? lots to do. We could we could we could and should plant more trees, but you know I think it's important to show the strides that we're making at the moment in terms of doing that. Scotland is genuinely leading the way in this field. It's been recognised by. Uh, by the United Nations that we are setting an example here. Imagine how much more we could do just with those powers of any other normal independent country to take forward the, these policies and show, as I say, show the rest of the world not just how it can be done, but how we are actually delivering that. And um, before we get to independence, um, we have a more immediate issue uh, facing us. We have Brexit mm -hmm. potentially yep. happening in just a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, how's your, what's your take on, on the situation at Westminster just now? Do you see any resolution within the next week or two? Well, you know, I think it's firstly important to say that Brexit, Brexit has fundamentally uh, laid bare how broken Westminster is and how, and I think people across Scotland are seeing how useful, useless uh, Westminster has been for Scotland in terms of recognising their needs or taking care of their concerns, not just now but into the future. So over the next uh, week or so, I think we heard from Ian Blackford that what we'll be doing is if the Labour Party and the Lib Dems are not willing to take action, we will in terms of putting forward a vote of no confidence. There is no such thing as a good Tory government for Scotland and a Boris Johnson Tory government is the worst possible manifestation of that. So we want him out, we want him out of office, we want the Tories out of office, we want to get this back to the people in a general election so that they can send a clear message that Scotland not only has continued to, rep uh, to uh, reject Brexit um, but now wants to underline that in terms of returning SNP MPs to Westminster. And then obviously we need to quickly move on to establishing our right to be an independent country through a referendum. I would just point out, you said there that uh, it couldn't get worse than Boris Johnson government. We did say that about Theresa May. <laughs> well, so. well, I've always said Boris Johnson would be that being part of Boris Island would always be the worst one of the worst options you could have. However, I take your point, <laughs> it's not an awful lot worse than, uh, than the other incarnations. If, um, and if, if there is to be a general election anytime soon, what do you, what do you see as the outcome of that? Well, I think, first of all, getting this band of, I think it's fair to say, charlatans out of office, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and all the rest of them, particularly Dominic Cummings, who's 
un the unelected bureaucrat who's pulling the strings behind this to get them out of office and then really to, uh, to establish the fact that we need to take this back to the people. First of all, the general election, and then of course Scotland needs its choice over its future. So it's a very clear path for me. I think we need to say to, to the Scottish people, here are your options for the future. You can have more of this that you've seen for the past three years, or you can, we can take our place as an independent nation amongst the European nations with an equal set the, uh, seat at the table, showing the same kind of clout that, uh, that Ireland have been able to demonstrate through this process, and, uh, and really take things to another level uh, for our people in the future. And just on that note, just finally, um, we've uh, we've heard a lot of people say that you know after all the chaos of Brexit, people aren't going to want to face the upheaval yeah. of uh, pursuing independence. Yeah. But at the same time, as you said, we've seen how much power Ireland yeah. has been able to exert exactly over so. the UK, uh, despite us being told for most of our lives that Ireland is mm -hmm. kind of unimportant and that Ireland basically is just an appendage mm -hmm. to the UK. Which way do you think it's which way do you think the people of Scotland will go when they're asked the question? Well the, the interesting thing is to actually speak to those people on their own doorsteps, which I do on a weekly basis. We you know I go around the constituency whenever I'm not at Westminster I'm knocking doors. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting to see the two types of reaction. One is we need to do something to get out of this and that's you know a lot of people who support us anyway. But the interesting thing is to see those people who haven't previously supported us or people who are genuinely fed up with Brexit. And they'll often say to me, Drew, oh, don't talk to me about Brexit. But then go on to talk for five or ten minutes about Brexit and about mm -hmm. the way it's affected them. Um, so, you know, people are fed up with this and they understand what's going on. But also, I sense very, very clearly from people an appetite for change. And that's been borne out in the opinion polls. Opinion poll after opinion poll is showing that people support Scotland's right to have a choice. And more and more, people are showing that they actually want Scotland to exercise that choice to become an independent country. But, it, but it's really, really interesting to talk to those no voters from 2014, many whom have changed their minds, but many more who are much, much more uncertain about how solidly against Scottish independence they are and saying that quite literally they have a choice to make in the future um, about that. That wasn't a message I got last time out, it wasn't even a message I got in 2017, but it's a very loud message I'm getting now. Yeah, well certainly uh, it's very difficult to make predictions about anything in <laughs> yeah. politics right now, but I'm, I'm sure we'll, uh, yeah. we'll see something yeah. moving in that direction soon, I hope. Drew, Absolutely. thank you very much for joining us Thank today. you, pleasure. <laughs>